My name is Juliette Reinders Former. I'm going to be talking about uh, UTF-8 in Unicode, so let's uh, change that from uh, talking about sex to uh, UTF-8. If you're going to tweet during the talk, uh, my Twitter handle is right there, so uh, feel free to use that. So let's start. Who of you have used Unicode in UTF-8 before? Right. How many of you have run into problems with it? Everyone. Good. So that's why you're here. Feel free and feel welcome. Please interrupt me if, if you've got any questions. If we're running out of time, I'll tell you to come back and uh, I'll answer them afterwards. Uh, it's not a new problem. As you can see from the quotes here, these quotes are from 2004. People have been struggling with Unicode and UDF8 for years. So some common misconceptions I'll get out of the way before we start. Unicode is not the same as UTF-8. Did anyone know that? Okay, three people. Good one to remember, it's not the same. Unicode, uh, UTF-8 or Unicode is not the same as internationalization. Same, again, how many people knew that? Oh, a lot more, that's good. And UTF-8 is not a child set. How many people knew that? Three people. Okay, I'll explain all of these in a minute. But first of all, I'm not going to give you advice on internationalization. I'm not going to tell you how to internationalize or localize your application, because that really depends on your application's architecture. And there's so many things to take into consideration. I'm just going to tell you how to get it right for you to get F8. Um, if you choose to use, the, you use UTF-8, and you should. Okay, so why worry about it anyway? Can any one of you recognize these items here or, or expand on them? Or the, the whole thing is really, basically, lo thinking local is an illusion. I mean, even your users might have characters in their names which are not uh, compatible with... Uh, one of the ISO characters said, sync, Helgi. We all know Helgi, don't we? One of the core developers of PHP. He doesn't like it when his batches show question marks for his uh, surnames. Seriously, you want to consider users like that. So even if your application is just a local application, you want to be able to deal with characters from other character sets than your own. So you, thinking local is an illusion. It's always think global. And why should you then choose UTF-8 or Unicode? Basically, it's code efficiency. UTF-8 is the, uh, Unicode's the ring to bind them all. UTF-8 is the way to implement it. And if you code with Unicode and UTF-8 from the start, it'll be a lot more efficient than having to refactor. Anyone tried to refactor an application to Unicode before? How did you like the hell you ended up in? Don't. Just get it right from the start. Start with Unicode, start with using UTF-8. It'll be a lot more cost efficient to get it right from the start. Okay, so how many, does anyone of you know how many living languages? There's, there's over 7,000. 7,000 living languages in this world. I mean, that's the, the languages we'll be dealing with. 308 of those are over, have over a million speakers. Does anyone know what the, the, the number one language in the world is? Chinese. Chinese. What's the number two? Spanish. Spanish. Absolutely right. Anyone know how, uh, how many languages are spoken in the one country with most uh, languages? Sorry? More than 200. Anyone else want to take a guess? 50? More bidding, <laughs> please, please. It's 837. That's just in Papua New Guinea. That's one country. And even France itself has over nine ex officially recognized languages. How many of you knew that? <laughs> I've actually listed them there. Those are the official uh, languages of France. <laughs> French is one of them. <laughs> so, l languages are written in different writing systems. If we first look now at the top 20 languages 
of the world and the writing systems in which they're, uh, they're written, out of the top 20, there's only seven written in the Latin script. The Latin script we use in France, but also in, in English. So we all think that's actually a really much used script. It's not. 13 of these are not written in Latin script. And if you take like, the, the top 80 languages of the world, out of the, the 7,000 languages, you'll actually reach 80% of the whole world population. But a lot of these are not written with the Latin script. And you will run into problems if you don't use Unicode and UTF-8. So if we look at scripts, how many writing systems are there in the world? Anyone wants to take a guess? 20? 100? Anyone else? About 180. But 180 is a lot less than those 7,000 languages. So we've got a lot less to deal with there. There's actually the, some languages which are, use different writing systems. Think Punjabi, which is written in Gurmunki and Sharmunki. Uh, there's the, one uses a more Arab-based script, one uses a more Hindi-based script. But it's the one language. But nearer to home, Serbia. If you use Serbian uh, in an application, or if you want to serve it to Serbian customers, you'll have to deal with both Cyrillic and Latin. Because it it's one language written in two different scripts. So realize that one script doesn't always translate straight to one language. And obviously, there's some extra scripts which we won't really use that much for web pages, but you might use them for fun. Anyone recognize that one? Yeah, hey, we've got a real geek here. <laughs> Points for that man. <laughs> if we look at the writing systems distribution, you see that all this blue uh, uh, is Latin, but with some variations. I mean, like in Africa, you'll have some characters which you would not recognize here, but they're still part of the extended Latin uh, alphabet. But there's massive parts where there's different uh, writing systems in use. And over here, you've got a lot of different writing systems. So, there's no such thing as plain text. Text always has a writing system associated with it, a character set, an encoding. There's no such thing as plain text. If you save a file as plain text, you, you don't know what you're doing. It's never plain text. So let's look at character sets and encoding. What are we talking about when we talk about Unicode? Character sets are a group of characters linked to a code page which uniquely identifies each character. So if we have this character, we can find it in this character set. And the encoding might encompass several character sets and is the way to translate the code point from the character set to bytes in the computer. That is the difference. A character set is a code page. Encoding is the way to actually save from that code page to bytes in the computer. Some character sets have, um, well, some encodings have several character sets. Some encodings only deal with one character set. And then we have Unicode, which is the one ring to bind them all. Unicode tries to actually encompass all character sets worldwide, everywhere. It currently uh, has over 100,000 characters in there, and it's got the capability of over a million characters. It is the ring to bind them all. However, Unicode has more encodings than one. So that's why we're talking about UTF-8 being different from Unicode. UTF is uniform transform, uh, Unicode transform format. It's one of the encodings for Unicode. You've got UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. The different encodings. Internally, Windows or Mac will use UTF-16. Uh, UTF-8 is, in general, the easiest to work with and is recommended because uh, uh, it's compatible with ASCII. So it makes changing over from legacy systems a lot easier. Um, if you look here at the different encodings at the bottom, you will actually see that you, the size of the characters, uh, the way they're encoded, is different. If you encode the character in UTF-8, it's got a variable size. It can be one byte 
or it can be four bytes, one, two, three, four, depending on the character and where it's mapped in the code page. With UTF-16 or UTF-32, it'll always be, uh, with UTF-16, it can be either two or four bytes, with UTF-32, it'll always be four bytes. So, for codes, uh, for your size of your database, for your size of your application, this will make a difference. UTF-8 might sometimes encode a character with more bytes than UTF-16, but it is a flexible, uh, flexible uh, byte size format. The advantages of UTF-8. Anyone wants to take a guess here? Size? Size? Anyone else? Compatibility with ASCII? Anyone else? There's actually quite a few. The backward compatibility, which I mentioned before. UTF-8 can actually encode every single Unicode character. That's a good one. That's important. XML, by default, requires UTF-8 or UTF-16. If you want to use another encoding in, in XML, you will actually need to make uh, really work on making that work. So UTF-8 is a good choice if you need to export data to uh, XML as well. UTF-8 and UTF-16 are the standards for having Unicode in HTML. Don't use UTF-7 or UTF-32 for that. UTF-8 or UTF-16 are in the RFC. This is what you should use. Another good thing is it can be fairly easily recognized. That's an important one. If you try to recognize whether something is UTF-8 or encoded in a different uh, uh, encoding, it's great if you can recognize it as such. UTF-8 can be recognized with a very small uh, chance of confusion. I think it's less than 3% confusion in, in most cases. And, uh, well, uh, in the majority, the real majority of cases, it's only like 0.13% uh, or something uh, chance of confusion. That's great because then you can check that the string you're actually getting is UTF-8. So you know what you're dealing with. Another good thing is uh, that sorting something on uns unsigned bytes will actually result in the same uh, order for uh, the Unicode code page. That's something which doesn't work the same with, with all the other uh, encodings for Unicode. So UTF-8 has advantages to use. It is the industry standard, so let's con just presume UTF-8 from now on. Everyone okay with that? You're all convinced you should use UTF-8? Good. So what's the problem? Literally everything defaults to non-UTF-8. Everything. So what's the solution? Anyone? Yeah, be explicit. Everywhere. And I don't mean explicit as in swearing, but you have to tell the computer to be, yeah, that you'll, you'll be using UTF-8 everywhere. Yeah, the, the swearing, you'll be doing that anyway. But I'm going to try and give you enough hints and tips so that you'll do less swearing. Because <coughs> this is what we will be covering. Literally, as anything I could imagine uh, what you might have to deal with. Start with, we're going to start with uh, dependency on the user computer setup. This is something most people forget. But when you, you, when you send data to a computer, a user's computer, you don't know whether they've got extended language support set up on their computer. You don't know what fonts they have installed. You don't know what browser they're using. All these things actually make a difference with Unicode. So let's have a look at what text really is, what characteristics of text. If we take an English phrase, what I really love, nice phrase to start with, very gentle, if we look at the language, that will be English. Writing system, Roman Latin, left to right, top to bottom, basic Latin as the character subset. The character encoding in this case is UTF-16 because I'm on a Windows computer. Uh, that can vary obviously depending on you know, how you're sending it out. Uh, and the font I've used is Arial. If we use the same phrase in Arab, we get a different answer to some of these. It's right to left, top to bottom, Arabic, Arabic. Okay, so hang on, there's differences there we need to take into account. So let's look at a phrase in a multitude of languages. 
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating here, by the way, because I'm using someone else's computer, so this is an image. I do not trust other people's computers to actually get this right if I uh, don't use an image. Sorry? I only got two of those installed. Well, actually, that depends on the fonts, <laughs> which you have installed more than anything. So this is uh, some 20 languages. If I then show you what fonts I've uh, used, okay, let's go to that one. You see I've used a multitude of fonts to display these. Why am I pointing out fonts? First of all, there's non-Unicode fonts available. Ever, anyone ever come across one? You have. Okay, you're not alone. I have too. Seriously, you get a document sent to you and it comes up being absolute nonsense. As in, you know, they're Latin characters, but it really does not make sense. And you expect something which is actually in a different character set. And you look at the font and you're like, okay, that's a font I don't know. You download the font and then suddenly it displays in the right character set, uh, or the, the right characters. Those fonts are non-Unicode fonts. They're fonts which actually use the, the ASCII code page where the Latin characters are to, well, they abuse the Latin code page to have their own characters there. And it's the font doing that. So they're, they're not actually changing the encoding, they're not changing the character set, they're using the Latin character set, but just using a font to display it differently. So that's really, really wrong. But it is something you will encounter also on the web. And you'll ma mainly encounter that for fonts which, uh, for characters which have only been added to the Unicode uh, standard in the last 10 years. So Myanmar is a typical example. Mia, uh, everyone knows Myanmar? Yeah? Or f formerly known as Burma. There's only a few fonts available which will display a, lot, a wide range of Unicode characters and none of them will actually be able to display them all. So if you want to have an application which will display all the Unicode characters, you will need a mixture of different fonts. So these were the fonts I used. So what will happen if I change that to Fedana? Anyone want to take a guess? Uh, nearly. Does anyone know what happened here? There's no representation of the letter in the font. No. The font which was originally used was a non-Unicode font. It was abusing the, Latin, uh, the ASCII code page for their own characters. So that's uh, a non-Unicode compliant font. What will happen if I then change all of this uh, to Arial? We'll look at that in a second, but let me first show you the importance of Unicode versus non-Unicode compliant fonts. Because uh, I am stressing this point a lot, because people will not uh, will get it wrong, and and you will not realise it until you actually really run into problems. This are two non-Unicode compliant fonts for the GScript. GScript is used in Ethiopia, Eritrea for Amharic and Tigra languages, for instance, Tigrinya. If you look at you will see that these languages, the, the phrase here, is not actually the same phrase anymore. So even if you use two different non-Unicode compliant fonts, the actual text displayed is not the same. That's the real danger of it. If we then look at the Unicode compliant version of, the, uh, um, of fonts for that uh, character set, you will see the phrase is the, sa whoop, is the same. Those are interchangeable, and that's the importance of using Unicode compliant fonts. So if I change everything uh, which I had before to Arial, this is what happens. What happens there to the Tigrid uh, sentence? No, the, the, the Myanmar sentence, which we looked at before, is not Unicode compliant. This one just means that Arial doesn't have the G script in it. So, enough about fonts. Everyone understands the importance of that? Okay. Let's go to the real fun part. Client side, HTML. Always de declare the character encoding. And the real important thing here is there's actually a precedence. So, if you send the character encoding, you better send it double rather than not at all. 
So an HTTP header will always overrule whatever character set you have in your document. So if you set the character set in your document as you know, a meta tag in the header, and you send it through the server as well, the server uh, HTTP header will overrule whatever you have in your, in your, H, uh, in your Unicode, uh, oh, sorry, in your HTML document. They have to be the same. But it's also, uh, you can then think like, oh, but let me just send the HTTP header because that'll overrule it anyway. Don't, because your user might save your web page locally on their own computer. If they then bring it up again, the HTTP header won't be there. So, in this case, duplication is actually a good thing. Most of the time with code, it's not a good thing. In this case, it is a good thing. For different uh, types of documents, you have different uh, um, advisories on how to use it. So, for client-side HTML, you can use those uh, meta headers here. You can also actually tell it whether it's left or right or, uh, uh, or what language it is. You can uh, do that in the HTML tag itself. And an important thing is those meta tags, which I mentioned here, put them at the very top of your document. Don't think, you know, okay, we have the HTML uh, start of the document, then we have a title, then we have, you know, description meta tag and some other SEO data, and then we'll have the, uh, uh, the UTF-8 declaration. No, don't. Because as soon as you send a title, as soon as you send any text to the browser, the browser will start to interpret. And they might get it wrong. And no matter whether you, whether you then send a, a meta header with the right encoding, the browser will have already interpreted and has gotten it wrong. So make sure this is actually one of the first things you have in your document before you send any text to the browser. Is that clear? Is that, that logical as well to people? Yeah, makes sense? Okay, for XML, similarly, again, you have the encoding at the top and you have the language code you can add to it as well. And the interesting bit here is be aware of standards mode versus quirks mode, which can really screw you over with CSS. With IE6, if you have anything above the doc type, it will go to quirks mode while any other browser will presume standards mode. So, nice little one to remember. Uh, this is, a, a, uh, really, if you have to support IE6, basically tell your customer you, they should move up. But, all the same, if you have to support it, this will be something to take into account. <laughs> For CSS, you can use uh, class names with Unicode characters. And that might be really useful in your application. You might actually have an application where users can give up class names themselves in, you know, in one of the admin fields. So you might want to take that into account. If you do so, make sure the very first line is that line I mentioned here. It's tell the browser which is receiving the document that it's a UTF-8 character set for the CSS file. Another few uh, tricks you can find here. Everyone see the, this? Anyone knows that tag? The, the language attribute for an HTML tag? The language attribute tells the browser this is a phrase in that specific language. You can use that with any uh, HTML tag. Is that 15 minutes in or 15 minutes till the end? To the end. Oh gosh, I'm going to have to rush now. Okay. Let's continue quickly then. Anyway, uh, when you look at the CSS uh, lines here, you can see that I use a pipe character and then an is. That means read everything up to the little dash here. So no matter which type of Chinese I'm declaring here as the language, this CSS rule will apply for all. That's a good thing. That way you can, you know, like for all the variations of Arab or all the variations of Chinese, you can declare one specific CSS rule which will catch them all. Another thing which I highlighted here is the sans serif at the end. Always use either serif or sans serif at the end. It's a catch-all. If the browser or if the user's computer does not have the fonts you 
declare here, it will know that it should try to find a font which is compliant with the encoding which you've mentioned before, and which is either serif or sans serif. So always have that at the end. Similarly, for you, uh, you can use languages again with the pipe character to declare the text direction. And this is interesting as well because when you use Unicode and when you are making it a multilingual application, it will have, have uh, implications for your whole CSS design. Like a float which would go to the right in a Latin script, it might have to go to the left in an Arab script dis uh, display. So keep that in mind when you're designing your application. Okay, similarly, JavaScript can actually deal with Unicode reasonably well but you also have to set the con uh, uh, content type and character headers, and you can use Unicode escape sequences. I'm gonna quickly move on now, because otherwise I'm not gonna reach the end. Communication with the client. First of all, putting files on the server. How many people have got this wrong? If anyone use uh, uh, FTP with OTDetect? And a lot of the OT detects will say, oh, HTML can, uh, should be sent over as ASCII. If you use uh, Unicode or, and UTF-8, you don't want it sent over as ASCII. It will corrupt your data. So make sure if there's like in your, bro in your FTP program a list of defaults which will use ASCII, make sure the ones uh, where you use Unicode are taken out of that list. Next one, URLs. We all know that nowadays you can use international uh, domain names, you can use Unicode characters in domain names. Anyone think that's a good idea? No one, good. Anyone see the difference between the two I've got there? The first one is in Latin, the second one is in Cyrillic. Cyrillic alphabet, got the same, char uh, well, a lot of the same characters as uh, the, the Latin alphabet, and definitely the characters I need to do fake PayPal. Not a good development, so if you at en in any way can avoid these kind of uh, domain names, the, uh, there is actually a spoof checking tool, uh, which I'll mention later, but these are dangerous situations, and it's a dangerous development. When you receive data from the client, you also have to be careful. Anyone ever use the accept character set attribute? Okay, one person, everyone else, please start using it. <laughs> I'm not joking. If any user will uh, enter any character which is not in uh, the, the um, which is not uh, in the same character set as the document. The browser will start interpreting and will de decide the character set in, in which it will send it. So you don't know in what character set you will be receiving your form data. So in, unless you actually set the accept star set in the form, you do not know in what uh, character set you will be receiving your data. Not a good thing. It will lead to corrupt data. Um, but by the way, this also, uh, I, I mentioned forms, but receiving the data from a client might also be an incoming RSS feed or ping banks. Check the HTTP headers when you receive an RSS feed and, and you want to display it on, on, in your uh, own website. Check uh, the HTTP header for a ping back for the character encoding. Yeah? Okay, if we then reverse the, the, the direction and we're sending data to the client, we mentioned the HTTP header uh, before, use it. But also, there's lots of HTTPXS directives and, and even HTTP conf uh, directives you can use. If you run your own server, well, if you run their own server and their application is the only application there, okay, you can actually overrule the HTTP header no matter what the application says through HTXs. This might be a great way when you're migrating an application to use UTF-8. But be careful, because if you forget you did that, and you, find a, uh, you run into bugs, 
you will have a hell of a time trying to debug it because you will not think of looking at the HD access file. So there's some directives you can set. You can change it. You can change the, uh, the, the default character sets. You can uh, add a character set for a certain document type. Uh, th there's more than this. You can actually force the type for, uh, for certain uh, document types. So have a look at this if you run your own server. If you don't, you can still use it with HD access, but it might not be as stable. And it depends on how your server is configured, where you're actually allowed to use these. So let's move on. PHP. You're all PHP experts, so shall I just skip that bit? Okay, maybe not. Um, it's not actually very friendly to uh, UTF-8, and it, it gets better. But starting off, the minimum version you should be using is 5.3. Better still, use 5.5. Then you might actually like to uh, use PHP with UTF-8. Before that, not so much. Uh, PHP 6 was supposed to be uh, completely Unicode uh, compliant. Unfortunately, development has stopped. So that's not going to happen. Um, there's a couple of extensions which are interesting. MB String, IconV, Internationalization. I'm going to go through those in a, in a minute. And there's a couple of classes which are interesting if you're not on 5.3 or 5.5. But first, what Kind of, what of the core functionality of PHP is UTF-8 safe? Anyone want to take a guess? That's, uh, I'm, I'm saying core functions, so not extensions. Core functions. String replace. Sorry? String length? Nope. These are actually the only three. That's the only, oh, the only three which are real UTF-8 safe. And that is provided you're actually giving it a well-formed UTF-8 string. If the UTF-8 string is corrupt in any way, not a good thing. <coughs> the must-read link I've given here is actually, it's kind of out of date by now but it contains a lot of information about how to deal with UTF-8 uh, in any sort of application. So it's an interesting read if you really want to get into it. The danger zone is really dangerous. Set locale. Anyone used set locale before? Right. Anyone know why that's a dangerous uh, function? Yeah, process-based. It's not thread safe. In other words, your application might set locale, and then another application in the same process might set the locale to a different one. And any, app, any function which is using locale as its base, and I mentioned a few there, but that also includes the get text extension, will break. In other words, not a good thing. And that means that most applications nowadays which for localization use get text will break at some point. This is not UTF-8 safe. Filter extension, great e extension, I love it. It's not UTF-8 safe if you're using it for text strings. C-type, forget about C-type if you're using UTF-8. Yeah? So, first of all, we always need to test for well-formedness. Why am I only testing for the first character here? Basically, if the first character doesn't match, nothing will match. And if the first character matches, it will be UTF-8. So this is the test to check whether it's uh, a UTF-8 string, a well-formed UTF-8 string. Do you notice the, the U here at the end? That means Unicode. PCRE can actually be used with Unicode. Uh, as long as it's compiled with it. Now, oh, yeah. Uh, over here is a little function to check whether PCRE uh, has been uh, compiled with Unicode. Uh, yeah, not every uh, version uh, installed it has been. That's a big screw you, uh, but yeah. It does happen. Make sure you test for it before you use the U character. If you don't test for it, 
and you then use the U character, you might end up with corrupted strings. Yet again, more corruption. So, some good things. You don't need HTML special characters anymore. Just use, uh, of, uh, actually, you don't need uh, HTML entities anymore. You just use HTML special characters. That makes things easier. Uh, if you do use uh, HTML entities uh, and special characters, always pass the character set at the end. Make sure you pass it. So it will interpret it correctly. String length will not wear, work because it counts bytes. Not a good thing. But this is a really easy way to do a, a string length count of a string anyway. Because the UTF-8 decode function, the UTF-8 encode and decode are actually not very useful in general because they just encode between UTF-8 and the Latin ISO uh, standard. But if you use it this way, it will just make a question mark of any Unicode character it will not understand. And any question mark is counted as one character. So this way is, is a really simple way to get correct string length anyway for UTF-8 string. MB string is actually heavier than using this. Okay. Mm. And MB string is not always available. But yeah, so this is a, an easy way to use string length anyway. Um, which basically covers what I just said about UTF encode and uh, UTF-8 encode and decode. We go to MB string. First of all, it's not always available. So test whether it's available before you use it. It is actually a great extension because it uh, tries to replace all the string functions with Unicode compliant, well, with, with character set based string functions. So you can pass the character set and then it will get it right for that character set. It will also do that with POSIX regular expressions, which you shouldn't be using anymore anyway, but just in case. And it'll also do that for the mail function. It also allows for conversion between different character sets. <coughs> MB string is, is really uh, your big uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss knife. This is where the one you want to use a lot. Definitely if your application has to be cross PHP version compliant. Icon-V, useful, but mainly used for converting between character sets. It's actually really good at dealing with files and filtering streams and handling output buffers. So use, uh, look at icon V for those uh, functionalities. Use MB string for the rest. However, if you're on PHP 5.5, use the internationalization extension. It only became available with 5.3 and has been extended steadily over every uh, PH new PHP version. So uh, even like in 5.4, I think 74 new uh, functions were added to the internationalization extension. Internationalization will actually give you a locale safe way of dealing with get text. So you can use, if you use the get text functionality in internationalization extension, you'll be fine. Don't use the normal get text extension. It has number formatters, date formatters, currency formatters. It has uh, converters between character sets. It has message formatters. So it's basically the Swiss army knife plus, 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 plus but only once you're on 5.5. 5.3, you can start using it, but it's not always uh, enabled by default. But 5.5, it gets really interesting. Anyone used the internationalization extension before? Good. I'm proud of you guys. Yeah. That's true. Uh, they're, they're not getting it completely right yet, though. It's because they're compatible with 5.3. Yeah. I'm going to move on because we are short on time. So communicating with a database. <laughs> How many people have run into problems with databases with uh, UDF8? Everyone. Absolutely. So first of all, the connection defaults to Latin. So the first thing you need to run before you run any query, just straight after you make a connection to the database, is set names or set character set. You really want to run that because that determines the, uh, the character set of your connection and tells you the, ser the database server you want to receive the results in UTF-8. It will save you a lot of hassle. And a really interesting one, 
if you like have a config file where you say, uh, okay, choose your character set and people write UTF-8. Everyone noticed here, there's no dash. So you can't just say, okay, UTF-8. No, for your database, you have to remove the dash. Nice one, eh? So if we then look at MySQL a bit further on, uh, I strongly advise you to use MySQL E. Don't use MySQL extension, use MySQL E or PDO. They really are better at dealing with Unicode. Uh, you need MySQL uh, 4.1 plus to start with because before that it didn't deal well with UTF-8. Then we're gonna have to look at what character sets are available and what collations are available. These are two general queries which will give you the information you need to see what's available on the server and what the defaults are. Uh, interesting, uh, isn't it? Latin, Latin, UTF-8, Latin, uh, Swedish, Latin, general, oh dear. Nice mixture. You want to synchronize that. You want to make sure all of them are set to UTF-8. So check this with your server where if you run into problems with UTF-8 in the database. Uh, so th these are two queries to, to see what the specific setup is for, for your database. And we can change things. If you run your own database server, you can change things on a server-wide level. Interesting. But only if you run your own database server. How many of you run their own database server? Well, good. You're in luck. You can just overrule the defaults on a server level. Everyone else is going to have to puzzle and figure out which uh, defaults they're going to have to change on a per process per request basis. Another thing to take into account when you're setting up databases or setting up tables is that UTF-8 strings have variables uh, width between one byte and four bytes. So anything which might have fit in a far chart with 255 characters before might now need to move to a blob. Tiny text, it's bytes which it's measuring not characters. So when you set up your database columns, when you set up your tables, if you use text columns, make sure you actually take into account that you're passing UTF-8 strings to it. Make sure that any max length you had is multiplied by four. That will give it enough space for UTF-8. Yeah? Anyone run into problems with that? Before, so like strings being cut off halfway? Right, that, that's why. <laughs> okay, collation. Does anyone actually know what collation is? It's, it's actually your sort order. And, uh, talking about sort order, by the way, array sort will screw you over with uh, UTF-8 as well, in, if you're uh, looking at PHP. But the sorting in, in uh, the database can be changed as well. This, uh, you can see the differences here. I've, I've used some Latin ones here. You can see the difference of how uh, certain strings are sorted. <coughs> and there's a number of, quite a large number of uh, Unicode uh, compliant sort orders available in MySQL. So check which one and test, test, test which one is most suitable for your application. The difference, well, the, the, the extensions, I mean, most people don't notice. The one is case sensitive, the other case uh, insensitive and binary. Binary will actually work with the same uh, data as the code pages in Unicode. So they'll give you the, uh, the code page ordering, which you would expect with Unicode. Okay, now you have an old database, which is still in Latin. You need to convert. It's actually really easy. It, just run that query on every table. And you can convert your database. Okay, I'm getting the, the finish sign. Can I, did, we're, we're really running out of time? Okay. I'm gonna just quickly go through what's mo the most important things. This one is an interesting one. You can actually change the collation and, and change the character set for a string li with a string literal. Yeah, I'm, so I'm rounding up. Uh, we, we help you, you the last one, so, uh, 20 seconds. 
20 seconds, okay. 20 seconds, I, I'd say any questions? That's the, the uh, more important one then. No, no, no question, question, question. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. We've run out of time, sorry. There's not that much more anyway. Bomb, bomb squad, if you need to know about bomb, come and find me. Yeah? <laughs>